Um, are we seeing slides? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sarala, and thanks to both you and Mary for making this uh, this long, longish set of uh, of meetings so um, so go so smoothly. Um, I really learned a lot and, and enjoyed the meetings and and uh, uh, today or this one this is the third uh, metadata working group um, presentation with the uh, emphasis on getting connected. <clears throat> so uh, data site has multiple multiple roles and today we're going to be talking about two of them. Uh, one of them is identifying resources like those shown here as circles. Uh, mostly data sets and publications, but also, of course, connections to funders and software and organization and people, organizations and people and many other things. And then the, <clears throat> the important role here illustrated schematically with a, a PID graph is making connections between all those things. <clears throat> and um, it's really exciting to be, uh, to be working with uh, so many people in data site and around uh, in the repositories and other places when these connections start to be made. And of course, the PIDs are the, the primary keys that make those uh, connections possible. So we'll be talking about that today as well. Um, talk about identifying resources and people and organizations and then making connections between those things. And then also the important role that you all have in sharing your suggestions uh, for new metadata elements and not just new elements, but ideas and, and, uh, and use cases and things like that that, uh, that come from the, the uh, data site community. That's great. <clears throat> so first in describing resources, um, data site currently holds about 24 million findable items. And the types of those things are given by the, uh, the required field uh, resource type general. Uh, resource type general, uh, Many of the of the values in the code list started in 2011 with the first version of the schema, and then in version 4.4, which came out in March of this year, we added 13 new types uh, to that controlled vocabulary to better describe textual resources. As you can see in the the picture on the left, the pie chart, text is the second most common uh, resource type. Uh, in data site. And so having a little more, uh, actually having a significant amount of, uh, of more detail about what those text things can be very helpful. Of course, changing and making additions to the metadata schema is the first step and the community adopting those changes is the, is the more important one. <clears throat> and um, the metadata working group is excited to to see that the types that were introduced just March, essentially six months ago, are already being used quite a bit. Uh, dissertation and journal article are already used more than 16,000 times each. Uh, notice that the scale on this only goes up to 6,000. So if I showed the full scale for everything, it would be going out of the top of our monitor somewhere. And actually, dissertation and journal article are, are I think, in the top 12 now in just six months in the top 12 already in terms of uh, resources that are that are resource types that are being used in data site. So that's super. Um, of course, as someone who worked for quite a number of years on metadata standards, I'm, I'm super happy to see standard added to this list. Uh, and uh, those of you that, that uh, write standards have to start registering them for DOI so that we can, we can get some noticeable blue over on the right-hand side of this plot. Um, we're going to have uh, four polls today, and this is the first one. Um, the current resource types are shown here. You can see all the new ones and the, and the old ones all here. And the first question for the but the first poll question is, are there other resource types that you need? Uh, and Mary is gonna help us. Uh, this is the mentee.com code 6296 And if you go there, you can enter that code and, and give us some input. Okay, so just to warn you that we decided that it would be okay to show the previous answers so we can compile everything. So you will see, you can vote here um, for new um, resource types for, that aren't appearing, or you can just add to what's already shown. 
Mary, one question I had on this, because um, it seems like presentation slide is just sitting there and nothing's happened to it. Is that is that a, something that's sort of hanging out on the slide or is it something that someone entered? I understand that to mean that the resource type presentation slide uh, would be useful. Would you uh, agree, Sarala? <laughs> that was my interpretation. I was okay. thinking no. the same, whether this Does, size makes a difference as well. Does that mean? Does, mm. Doesn't the size mean it's been entered more than anything else? Yes. Yeah. I would note there are a couple of different spellings of that also represented in other places on this graph. Ah. Oh, yeah. Presentation slides. <laughs> Good one. Yeed. Yeah, I think I think the the uh, the appearance of protocol on this list is really interesting. I mean, that's a, a very interesting uh, sort of a new kind of resource that's being shared uh, and getting DLIs for protocols would be really cool. Um, I'll stop sharing, but I'll leave that open if anyone wants to add any more. Uh, you can go ahead and share again, Ted. Great. Okay, are we, are we back to the slides? Participants can now see my screen. Wonderful. Okay, so... <clears throat> That's for identifying resources and types of resources. Another important set of identifiers is people that are involved in, in creating and making contributions to those resources. Um, these, this is a list of the uh, repositories, the data site members that have the, the, most, uh, the most records that include uh, ORCIDs. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of ORCIDs earlier today and um, Right now, creator identifiers, uh, which are mostly ORCIDs, about 85% ORCIDs, others, others are also, other identifiers are also there. They occur in about 10% of data set metadata records, data site metadata records. So we have a long way to go in terms of um, increasing the number of people that are connected to uh, data site resources. And there's a lot of ideas about ways to do that. Um, <clears throat> the contributors are also, uh, you know, very important uh, contributors to this to this infrastructure of, of knowledge. And um, contributors can also have orchids in data site metadata. Uh, and unfortunately, they're they're uh, less common than orchids for identify or orchids for creators. So we have a, a work cut out for us there. Um, identifiers for organizations are um, super, also very important. Um, and uh, the, the research organization registry is a, is a recently, I guess it's not so recent anymore, but a, a cooperative, uh, an open community that involves data site and Crossref and ORCID and others um, in identifiers for organizations. And uh, these are again, like the last slide, the 10 most common, uh, the 10 repositories with the most records with organizational identifiers. So these are really the, the, or, the dry, dry <laughs> data site members that are currently leading uh, the adoption of these identifiers. Um, the first uh, step, of course, towards uh, having identifiers in your metadata is having affiliations. And uh, right now, about 23% of data site members currently include affiliations. So we also have a, uh, a lot of work cut out for us in terms of adding affiliations and then hopefully identifiers for those organizations to the metadata. So no, like on one of the previous slides, the, uh, the line, the, the bar on the left for IPK.GBIS um, is, is broken here because it actually has 208,000, over 208,000 uh, organizational identifiers in the metadata. And um, that's a big number since it, on the other slide we saw that the second leading uh, repository has 37,000. So seeing 208,000 is really pretty amazing. And um, 
<clears throat> they actually have 208,373 metadata records and the same number of creator affiliation identifiers and the same number of contributor affiliation identifiers, which is, of course, sort of an interesting uh, observation. But it even it becomes more interesting because they actually only have one identifier that occurs 208,373 times in all of these records. So as someone who looks at, at data a lot, that was a very uh, interesting and surprising observation for me. And it brought up the question in my mind, uh, is, it, is it common for repositories to only need a small number of organizational identifiers? <clears throat> so this is the figure that we had before. And I, try, I was trying to find a, a visualization uh, because I'm a visual learner at heart that would help understand um, what the distributions of, of affiliations are in these uh, in these repositories. And so uh, I made a pie chart, a simple pie chart. And um, of course, as we just said on the last slide, uh, this repository, IPK GBIS, has only one uh, identifier in it. So in this case, the, the pie chart is all one color. Uh, it's maybe a boring pie, but uh, it's, it's, that's what all, all, all blue means, one. Um, the second leading uh, repository here is Dryad. Uh, and most people know Dryad, uh, uh, a significant uh, uh, general repository for data associated with papers. And um, in Dryad's case, their picture is sort of the opposite. In, in these pies, just because of the way that I got these data, the maximum number of slices in the pie is 10. Uh, Dryad actually has thousands of, of roars, but the distribution of those is much more uniform uh, across the top 10 uh, and, and completely different than uh, IPK GBIS. And it turns out that if we look at the rest of these repositories, most of them uh, look a lot like uh, IPK GBIS and Dryad really sticks out. On some of these, you can see little slivers of light, maybe. Um, in the Old Dominion University, there's a significant uh, second piece. But the interesting thing here is that most of, these, uh, most of these leading organizations here have pies that are mostly blue, which means that they're able to uh, add identifiers to many of their metadata records with only a small number of organizations. So uh, it turns out that there are a lot of institutional or, or domain repositories in, um, uh, in, in DataCite. And, and many of those, several hundred of them actually, actually include a very small number of organizations. General repositories like Dryad, um, they have a larger number of organizations, a larger number of contributors in many cases. And so finding affiliations and adding finding identifiers for those can be much more challenging. But the important part of this observation for me, knowing that there are a number of institutional and domain repositories in DataCite, is that those repositories can really help us help be leaders um, and have play an important role in demonstrating the benefits of having these identifiers in their metadata, things like the PID graph and, and other connections uh, that help uh, those, those institutions find people that are using their data, find people that are um, uh, doing uh, research that's related to those organizations. So we can look to those domain repositories for really helping us lead this uh, migration towards uh, increased identifiers in, in metadata. <clears throat> so second poll question, should, because affiliations are, are so important and they're, as I said, unfortunately rather rare, uh, well, they're in about almost a quarter of data site metadata records. Uh, some people think that those affiliations should be mandatory so that we could take advantage of the connections across the whole, uh, all of data site. So that is the second poll question. Can you see it? <laughs> yes.
we're sort of getting a, uh, maybe not a resounding uh, answer of no to this question, uh, which I can understand because getting uh, affiliation information can be difficult. Uh, in, in the published world, represented by uh, Crossref and other, um, other uh, identifier creators, affiliations are actually much more common than they are uh, than, than our ORCIDs. Many of you who live in that world know that essentially all authors for papers have affiliations and, and typically a small number of them um, have ORCIDs. So one of the advantages of trying to do retrospective affiliation uh, uh, archaeology, what I call it, is that there's a lot of affiliations around out there, uh, which makes them uh, easier in some ways than orchids, although they also change as a function of time, so that's difficult. So filling, filling in affiliations in, in historic collections uh, is, is a challenge. <clears throat> hmm. I'm going to stop that, but you can still vote. Great. Okay. Okay. Next topic is um, connecting these resources, people, organizations, funders, and uh, uh, connecting these things together. So this is a, a picture of a, a PID graph, and probably many of you have heard about the PID graph. And, and the, the, the identifiers that we've been talking about, uh, DOIs, ORCIDs, and ROARs, and other PIDs, are, are what enable the, the uh, entities, uh, publications, researchers, funders, and data sets to be identified, and they act like primary keys in the database that connects these. The PIG graph provides a picture of those. In this case, uh, in this picture, it shows all of the uh, resources um, and researchers associated with a, a single funder in the middle here. So the PIG graph is a great tool for um, funders and other organizations to find work that's related, uh, that people that are related to those organizations are doing, either funders or universities or research uh, institutes or things like that. And I think it's also going to be more and more of an important way to find data sets, to find publications, uh, and use the follow these connections to, to find them. Um, different than you know, Google text searches and things like that. <clears throat> so data site has two important tools for making these connections. Uh, first, related identifiers, and second, the, <clears throat> the new uh, term or the new element related items. So the kinds of relationships in um, uh, data site are shown by this picture. And um, as I already said, that these are making connections. And in, uh, in data site, over 16 million data site metadata records include related resources. Remember that there are roughly 24 million uh, records altogether. So more than half of them include related resources. And of course, many of those include multiple uh, related resources. The event data picture that will come up later shows about 48 million uh, connections between things. So maybe the average number of related resources is, is three, uh, something like that. But obviously that's pretty crude calculation. Um, one of my favorite things I mentioned earlier that I work with, uh, I've worked with a lot of scientific metadata standards that are more detailed than data site, which is really focused on identifying and connecting things. Um, and has metadata is uh, a relation type that allows you to point from your data site discovery record that you maybe uh, find by following connections uh, to a more detailed uh, metadata record that, that would support things like the um, I, the interoperability, and the R, reusability in FAIR. Um, data site focuses mostly on the F and the A, the findability and the accessibility, but the things that get pointed to by has metadata are, the, are things that are really critical for the interoperability and reuse of data sets that are discovered. Uh, it was great to see uh, earlier today um, uh, present a, a little a short presentation by Marco. 
and I'm spacing his last name here from FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN. Uh, FAO actually has over, is responsible for uh, over a million of this 1.4 million has metadata uh, examples. Um, so they're, they're relying on this to point from data site back to their uh, more detailed metadata. Another organization that does really well in that in that in doing that is ECMWF, which is a weather forecasting European weather forecasting group um, that has that includes has metadata links for all of their all of their DUI. So this is a great partitioning um, partitioning of effort uh, between discovery and connections in data site and detailed scientific metadata in some other uh, typically in some other metadata dialect. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, we're experts now at polls. This is the third poll. These are the relation types that currently exist in data site. And the question is, are there other relation types you need to make connections from your metadata? So I would just invite everyone to take uh, one or 30 seconds more to have a look at the existing um, relation types that are listed there. And I will share. Great. Yeah, we have plenty of time. There's, that came up in the last session that we had to go back and have a look at the slides. Um, of course, one of the nice things about these is that there's pairs. Uh, so there is cited by and cites, or is supplement to and is supplemented by. So you really only have to remember half of them. <laughs> sort of. Um, okay, let's see what comes up here. I think Susan is saying the the poll is showing the previous results and that's that's intentional. Um, so yeah. we can get, we, this is the third time this uh, poll has been given. So we wanted to get everybody uh, into one, uh, whoops, showing, oh, the previous question, Susan said. Sorry, Susan, I just was only seeing part of your chat. <laughs> yeah, there is a time lag when a new question is posted to replace the old one. This actually says relation types, not resource types. It's slightly different, but very similar. Right. Is output of, that's an interesting one. I like that one. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing again, uh, but carry on voting if you want to. Great. Thanks so much, Mary. Okay, so identifying things and connecting things. Um, in a lot of situations, there are, uh, or in some situations, there are uh, resources, important resources that don't have identifiers. In some cases, they're older uh, 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 older papers or various things that just for some reason don't have an identifier. And um, in, the, in the most recent version of the schema 4.4, we added a, something uh, called related item that we can use for uh, making the connections to those, uh, to those objects that don't have uh, identifiers. And of course, because there is no identifier, you need more citation information in order to be able to find uh, those items. So related item includes standard uh, citation kinds of uh, elements like title, journal, date, pages, things like that. So the primary use case for those is for uh, connecting to uh, items that don't have identifiers. <clears throat> um, Unfortunately, this introduces into the schema two ways that you can make these uh, relations, either using just an identifier or using a, an identifier and uh, a more complete description. 
uh, because the related item also includes an identifier. And we did that because there were some use cases that uh, the community brought up where they wanted to have an identifier and more detailed citation information. So we were trying to uh, uh, kill two use cases with one stone here. Um, we wanted to warn you though, that in those if you have uh, a related item with a related identifier, those identifiers are not yet picked up in the event data. So what that means is um, those uh, connections made uh, are not in the PID graph. So if you have a related item that has an identifier um, and you don't need that additional citation information, you know, stick with a related identifier, or if you need that citation information, repeat the related identifier um, inside the related item and also by itself so that those important connections be, uh, be made um, or are made. Uh, I mentioned in the last description event data. So event data is an interesting uh, and emerging um, set of data being managed and created by uh, DataCite and uh, Crossref and others. And it has links between publications and data citation, data citation and software reuse, has a number of different sources, including uh, Crossref, DataCite, and uh, various social media uh, kinds of things like tweets. Um, whenever a DOI is mentioned in one of those sources, the, the source that it comes from uh, and the DOI uh, goes into the event data. And uh, right now there's 93, uh, 90, almost 94 million events in event data. And um, <clears throat> this shows that, that uh, just over half of those are data site related identifiers. So this is where that 48 million number came up. But keeping track of the kinds of these connections that are being made, and of course, keeping track of the, the flow of, of social media, um, <clears throat> information uh, and, and inputs is, is really an exciting thing in event data. There is some effort um, to recognize titles of things in addition to uh, identifiers for things in, um, in, in the social media flow. So we wanted to mention event data because it's a very interesting uh, Sort of, sort of a new, it's been around for a few years, but uh, many people are not as familiar with it as, as with the um, regular data site API. Um, DMP connections, uh, in the new version of the schema, we added something called output management plans because we wanted to address the fact that uh, research projects um, have more than just data as outputs. So data, software, presentations, um, of course, publications were already covered, but the, the non-publication piece, many of us still say DMP because we're creatures of habit, but in the, in the new schema, this is really OMP. Um, and um, this is an example, and actually I think this is the slide that has occurred uh, the most um, uh, times today, which I'm happy about my uh, actually, my wife Erin produced this slide uh, as part of Fair Island, so um, I'm glad that it's, I think it's really a great example. Um, in the middle of this is a DMP, which has a DOI, is in data site for the Morea uh, project, which is an island in um, French Polynesia. And when, when, um, Cup, when we started looking at this uh, at this DMP, it had a lot of names of people who are uh, around here on the lower left, and then had uh, one funder, uh, the Moore Foundation, and also the Gump South Pacific Research Station, but data sets and publications, nothing had been added. So this is a project that has been going on for a number of years, um, and actually the project has come to an end already, and um, we, people that uh, were working on, on, on the Fair Island project knew that this project had data sets and publications and actually um, looked up uh, DOIs for three data sets and uh, eight publications. 
that had come from this project. So this is the, you know, this is a uh, connections made through the new DMP kind of uh, resource in Datasite to a, a number of people, uh, or funders, um, other organizations, and then also data sets, data sets up here and, and papers here. So this is really the, the direction that, that a lot of people are thinking about going in terms of machine actionable DMPs and using these DMPs to make connections uh, between things. Of course, the coolest thing about this is that uh, Kristen Garza at Datasite made a great um, uh, notebook, uh, Jupyter notebook for inputting a uh, inputting a DOI. In this case, the DOI for the for the data management plan and seeing the connections that are uh, enabled in the metadata for that DOI. And of course, um, that. Uh, that notebook works for any, it doesn't have to be a, a DMP, uh, it could be anything. So, um, and Aaron actually found this quite uh, easy to use. So uh, when the slides come out, the URL is in the, or, or there, or you can search for uh, this title and, and put your own uh, DOIs in at the center and, and watch your connections grow. <clears throat> uh, the fourth, uh, and last, thank you so much for your feedback so far on the, the first three. Uh, the fourth one is a little bit more complicated. Two questions. Um, we've talked a lot about metadata improvements in, um, in, in a number of these sessions today. We want to know what, uh, what improvements are important for you and, and your users. And um, we'll see in a minute the, the roadmap, the data site roadmap. Included in that, in that roadmap is um, a... Uh, a, uh, a dashboard that, that uh, has bibliometrics uh, and other metadata characteristics that might evolve over time as we improve. So the second question we have is which of those characteristics uh, are you interested in tracking? <laughs> it's always that, that, those scary moments when you say, hmm, am I talking to anybody? <laughs> uh, Ted, while we're waiting, there's a request for the URL for that Jupyter notebook. Can you drop that in the chat? Uh, yeah, let me find that. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of in the notes for the slides, I can find it if you like. Yeah. I, um, I thought it was in the notes for the slides. But I don't see it there. Uh, into the chat. Okay. Okay, that um, is now in the chat. Thank you. Um, I think this one is quite difficult and takes some thinking about. So as before, we'll leave it open and move on uh, to the last one. This might also be an opportune moment to remind folks that the Q&A option is available if there are questions.
Okay, not getting much traction. Uh, <laughs> okay, one more vote, just in, but I will I'll stop sharing and there's still time to vote on that. Okay, we, we have a way to get more traction as time moves on. So I'm happy to show that. Um, one thing that we announced, uh, the metadata working group announced in March, um, or maybe it was in May after the, uh, the release of 4.4 is an updated crosswalk uh, between data site and Dublin core. Um, and the, uh, the URL for that crosswalk uh, is here. Uh, Dublin core, everyone here is familiar with Dublin core, a nice, another uh, sort of lightweight uh, discovery, mostly discovery oriented uh, metadata dialect. Um, and then new ideas. Uh, we mentioned several times that uh, the data site community is, is an important, obviously, set of, of people who have things that they need to do and new ideas. Um, the data site has recently made their roadmap available uh, at this URL. You can get from the data site homepage to the roadmap or go there directly. Um, it's a place where new ideas uh, about new capabilities, new features, and also metadata came, uh, changes can be can be input. Uh, those suggestions can be uh, talked about during open hours, data site open hours, and um, currently stay up uh, for uh, up to two months. Uh, six suggestions so far have uh, made it through the gauntlet and been validated using this process. And um, the metadata working group is, of course, watching the roadmap and, and participating and commenting on things and suggestions that that um, a number of suggestions uh, already um, in the roadmap are of interest to the working group and more will come from there. So some of particularly the last two poll questions uh, needed some time and some uh, some some thought. And uh, the roadmap could be a way to uh, provide more details on, on your answers to those questions um, as time goes on and, and also to see uh, what other people have, uh, what other people suggest. The, the roadmap looks like this. This is the URL we were just looking at. Uh, there are four uh, categories for these items. Um, uh, under consideration, planned, in progress, and launched. So you can hopefully watch your, uh, your ideas or ideas that you like uh, migrate along this tortuous path. Uh, if you have a new idea, there's a button here that's a little smaller than it's shown on this slide, but still uh, big and useful. And you can use that to submit a new idea. Uh, once you submit that idea and press the submit button here, uh, you, get a, you in, enter your email here so that uh, data site can uh, can communicate back to you about this idea and you'll actually get a, an email from from the roadmap um, you know asking if you're really a human being and and if if this was really your crazy idea and you say yes and then the, uh, the idea goes up there so this is a super exciting um, way to collect information and share information uh, across um, the community and also, of course, data site staff and, and, and members of the metadata working group and others. So that's the last slide. Uh, this is the current um, makeup of the metadata working group. Uh, we are looking for new metadata working group members. And um, there is a URL uh, which will be in the slides. I can also track this one down if you're dying to get into the metadata working group right away. Um, but that's uh, that's the end of the slides, and I guess we have some questions. Stop sharing. Uh, Q and A. No. So far, it's very quiet. We have a lot of stuff going on in the chat. Mm -hmm. Hello, Sheila. Nice to see you. Thanks, Ted. So I went through all the messages. I think you answered all of them. 
If you want to talk, you can uh, um, put your hand up as well. Raina Jenkins from Canada has a question. Um, sometimes an organization is the creator, definitely true. Uh, in that case, the creator, there is a name type associated with the creator, which is either personal or organizational. If, the, if, if that name type is organization, then the name identifier, which happens in that creator section of the metadata, would be expected uh, probably to be an ORCID or some other organizational I'm sorry, to be a ROAR or some other organizational identifier rather than an ORCID identifying uh, that you would use to identify that, that creator if that, if that creator was a person. So um, uh, Rain is definitely right there that um, in the, if, the, if the creator or the contributor is an organization, then ROAR becomes a name identifier instead of an affiliation identifier. Actually, that came, uh, I was watching the chat at the time, that came uh, during the part where we were talking about affiliations. Right. And, and some organizations actually do have affiliations. Uh, for example, there are small labs that are located within larger organizations in my specialty. And so the larger organization, like the Jet Propulsion Lab, wants to be mentioned as the affiliation of the instrument team that is the organization that produced a data set, for example, and that's fine. The metadata can handle those relationships very nicely. So if that exists, by all means, use it. Um, the other point that was made with respect to affiliations is that perhaps it would be reasonable to have a, an unaffiliated value that could be used as a standard value to say, this person is known to have no affiliations at this time. Uh, and of course, the usual, uh, you'd need, want some way to indicate the affiliation is not known and probably not knowable for things like my legacy data where it was created 50 to 100 years ago and I, there's no way I can track down who was affiliated with what at that point in time, but at least people could stop looking. There's a question in the Q&A. Is there a connection between the RDA PIDs for instrumentation working group and the data site metadata group? Um, I happen to be the chair of that RDA group um, and a member of the uh, metadata working group. So there is a connection. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had much time to, to spend on that uh, at one of my roles. But um, there's also been a lot of discussion between uh, DataSite and uh, members of the RDA uh, PID Inst group um, uh, about moving forward. And um, that is one of the items which is currently, uh, I'm not sure if it's on the roadmap, but it's definitely in the list of, of items that the, uh, that the metadata working group is considering this year. Um, and so the answer, I think, is, is, is a strong yes. Um, there are some groups already. NCAR is one uh, that's using physical object for describing uh, not only instruments, but platforms like airplanes. And uh, they're an atmospheric research group in, uh, actually in Boulder. Um, so there are some people that are already using it um, without the instrument uh, resource type. Um, and of course, uh, Marcus and Rolf and others um, are also experimenting uh, already with it. And so, yes, there's a lot of connection. Okay, Mark, Serena, whoa, hey, Mark. <laughs> there's so many people that uh, are in metadata land that uh, I know and I haven't seen for so long because of this weird situation that we're in. So it's really nice to see them uh, coming and, um, and contributing to uh, the data site community. Oh, Liz says there is a roadmap card for instruments, great. Okay, well, if, uh, if there are no other questions, I guess we can go to recess early. I, I'm not actually sure Sarala knows if there's something after this. Yes, we have uh, a product session after this. 
So ah. you're welcome to join. Uh, it will be a working session as well. Part of it will be um, uh, um, working on which voting on which items that everyone would like to push forward to next year uh, for data site services. Uh, yes, so please do join the next session. Um, and uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending this session and also participating in the voting because uh, the information is really helpful for, make, for us to make decisions uh, because this is the metadata schema is for the community. So we would like to implement the fields that you want to have on it. So it's really helpful. Thank you so much. So this is the end of the metadata sessions in the members evening. Third Thanks one. so much to Sarala and, and Mary for making this go so smoothly and to everybody for participating. So I'll see you in metadata land. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.